Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight for our program, The Railway Post Office by Dr. Frank Shear. We are the DC chapter of the National Railway Historical Society, and we present free public programs on the third Friday of every month to further our mission, expand the public appreciation of railroads and their history. I'm Scarlett Wirt, Program Coordinator for DC NRHS, and I'm happy you can join us. A few words of introduction before we get started for those of you who may not be as familiar with our organization. Uh, you may have heard of our Pullman car, the Dover Harbor, an Amtrak qualified car that goes all over the country um, behind Amtrak. We also have the Collins Villain and Franklin Inn, uh, two bud coaches, also Amtrak qualified, our, our railroad library in the tower in Bowie, Maryland. We sponsor rail camp scholarships with NRHS and Amtrak. And last but not least, the timetable, um, our monthly newsletter on railroad topics and history. Uh, we're really proud of the newsletter. And I will just mention that Ann Mason, who is hosting our Zoom tonight, also is our timetable editor. So if you're new to DC and RHS, we'd love to have you as a member. So we will be using the chat feature tonight for questions. Uh, it's our normal practice. So please do use that along the way to post anything you'd like to ask Dr. Shear. We typically take the questions during a question and answer session at the end of the programs. So please mute your mics if you haven't already and pull up your chat box as we begin. Our program tonight is on the railway post office and we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Frank Shear, longtime curator for the Railway Mail Service Library. Dr. Shear has provided stewardship for this priceless collection since 1980 and operates the library today from the former NW Railway Depot in Boyce, Virginia. Dr. Shear's ongoing research dates back to his graduate days where he studied the Railway Mail Service and Postal Transportation Service between 1864 and 1977. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shear. Well, thank you very much, Scarlett. Uh, as Scarlett mentioned, this is um, a uh, an opportunity for people to learn more about railway post offices and how to do historical research about railway post office covers. So what we're going to do, we're going to cover several subtopics. All right, to, to keep the session within an hour, we'll cover an overview of the railway mail service, and then we'll talk about functions of a railway post office. There's two sections that are included in the PDF file that's been shared with you. Um, and uh, if you don't have it, uh, you can also send an email to me directly and I will send it to you. Uh, one that this, uh, that Roman numeral three that discusses railway post office markings uh, and then the information resources under Roman numeral four we're going to skip over those, but the content is in the PDF handouts. So if you review those, you have questions, uh, my email address will be at the end, or Scarlett can also share it in the chat box. I'll be glad to uh, help you with any questions that you may have. So after we go through uh, Roman numeral one and two, we'll go straight to five, and that is an example of how people can research a uh, we call them covers, but basically it's a stamped envelope that's got postmarks on it and uh, talk about the different kinds of covers. So let's talk about what the railway mail service was. Uh, the railway mail service was a part of the post office department, and uh, there is no real official emblem, if you will, of the uh, railway mail service. But the badge, this badge that's illustrated here, served as the uh, uniform for railway postal clerks from 1899 through the end of the service. Now, in the 1960s, uh, there was a shift to uh, photo identification badges, but uh, the, the uh, metal badges that you see here were not taken up. Uh, by the office and so many of the clerks on the remaining railway post offices continue to wear them as a source of pride. The uh, first experimental route was in 1862 between Hannibal and St. Joseph, Missouri. And the reason it's considered to be experimental 
which was on the Hannibal and St. Joseph Railroad between Hannibal and St. Joseph is, is for uh, several reasons. First of all, the car was only operated in one direction for sorting mail. And that sorting consisted of uh, separating the mail out for the Butterfield Overland stage that would leave St. Joseph, Missouri and head further west towards California. So uh, what they found was that by sorting the mail and separating out that mail to go further west while the train was running between Hannibal and St. Joseph, they were able to advance the mail by uh, a, a day or two uh, going out west. And it all only operated in one direction. And the other thing was that it did not make dispatches to towns along the way. So the first permanent route was established on August 28, 1864, between Chicago, Illinois, and Clinton, Iowa, on the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. And coinciding with that date, the railway mail service was established as a part of the post office department. And George B. Armstrong is the person who was the first general superintendent. Uh, many of you may know that the final trip was on June 30th, 1977, between New York and Washington, D.C. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that there were no railway post offices that have ever been operated by Amtrak. Penn Central and then later Conrail continued to operate that route, and it was trains uh, three and four. Now, the Railway Mail Service was renamed the Postal Transportation Service in 1949, and then it became the Postal Transportation Service, um, and after that, uh, then the Bureau of Transportation. The reason for the name change in 1949 was there was a declining influence of railroads. By that time, in 1941, as we'll mention a little later, they had uh, established Highway Post Office Service, uh, air mail was becoming prominent. And uh, so um, the mail service was not exclusively by railroad any longer. So uh, they just felt that calling it the Postal Transportation Service in, in 1949 was a more appropriate um, means of, of describing what it was. And uh, there were some other operational changes that occurred when it became the Bureau of Transportation. I'll, I'll skip over those. Some of that is in the notes pages. But uh, during most of the 20th century, there were 15 railway mail service divisions. And during the course of this presentation, I'm going to continue calling it the railway mail service and not uh, these other names uh, just for consistency. But uh, after 1956, the uh, 15 divisions uh, became 14 divisions, uh, 14 regions. And uh, again, that's covered in the notes pages uh, in a lot more detail. And this is the reason why um, one of the things that people may need to do in understanding the covers or, or what railroads were in particular railway mail service and uh, postal transportation service division is that uh, you need a cross-reference table that shows what states um, the uh, railroads were located in and then how that correlated to the division for the railway mail service. Uh, so the uh, 14 divisions were very much aligned uh, as they were before 1956 uh, with the consolidation of a couple districts and realignment of some others. One misnomer is that some people have is whether railway postal clerks were actually railroad employees. And, and the answer is no, they were postal employees that were assigned to railway post offices. And they, because of the name changes for the railway mail service uh, to Postal Transportation Service and Bureau of Transportation, they likewise had three different titles. Uh, there were railway postal clerks between 1864 and 1949. After that, postal transportation clerks between 1949 and then until 1960, and they were called mobile unit clerks between 1960 and 1977. Again, we're just going to continue calling them railway postal clerks. 
and that was uh, railway postal clerks as a title was specified in an 1882 daily postal bulletin. So we'll do a backwards time uh, lapse here on September uh, 5th, 1972. You have what is now known today as the American Postal Workers Union that was formed there in 1972 from the United Federation of Post Office Clerks and the National Postal Transport Association. Now, the uh, Railway Mail Association was created in 1904, and it changed its name to the National Postal Transport Association in 1949, uh, because in um, 1913, the Railway Mail Association enacted a uh, clause that said you had to be a Caucasian to be a member of the Railway Mail Association. The... Uh, um, National Federation of Post Office Clerks was, was established. And then the Accident Benefit Association was one of the main benefits because uh, railway postal clerks could not get insurance because uh, working in the railway mail service was considered to be a high risk job. This was the uh, main office uh, or the home office of the Railway Mail Association uh, located in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It's now been relocated to Rochester, New Hampshire after 2006. And uh, that building uh, was still there. And it uh, um, is now used as an insurance company office, but it's still there. Still has a plaque on it on the outside that says the roof of C. Ross Memorial Building. So now we're going to talk briefly about what the functions of a railway post office were. Many of you may have seen this ad. It appeared as a part of a series in the Saturday Evening Post and perhaps some other publications as well uh, by the New York Central System. And uh, the title for this particular one is Traveling on a Postage Stamp. But the basic message was this series of ads was uh, created to illustrate the 20th Century Limited. And so it had other ads that described the dining car, the sleeping cars, uh, other amenities on the train. The point of the ad here was, even if you were on the 20th Century Limited, which was a, uh, a high um, fare train, nobody except for the railway postal clerks could go into this car. You could be anywhere else in the train, but you could not go here. And so what it does is it, uh, it's a cutaway view. Uh, that's the reason why I like to add it is because it shows you basically the same three sections of a railway post office car that no matter whether it says New York Central or any other railroad on the outside of the car, the post office department specifications uh, required these particular areas. And it also didn't make much of a difference whether it was a full length car or a half length railway post office car or a railway post office car that only took up 15 feet. Um, the only difference was how many uh, fixtures of these various kinds they had uh, to accommodate the space. So in the upper right hand corner, it says washroom and lockers, but um, there's an area there where pouches and sacks are stored. And then at the lower left-hand corner, it's the same. So this is where they put working mail that was going to be worked by the clerks as the clerks took care of making dispatches of the mail that they already had on their uh, countertops. Uh, there was certainly plenty more to bring forward and, and sort. Uh, the next area where it says pigeonholes, they're properly called distribution cases and uh, the clerks would be sorting letters into those cases. And they had specific diagrams that labeled exactly how those cases uh, were going to be laid out. They also varied by train. So for example, uh, leaving from Chicago, heading towards New York City, they were sorting New York City letters. They were sorting uh, Albany letters and Cleveland letters. And then they were also sorting for towns along the way and then making connections with other railway post offices at other junction points. 
uh, in the um, uh, going westbound, it was exactly the reverse. And in fact, in some cases, they were even uh, making up mail for California. It was um, a very, you have to think about railway post offices being uh, an integrated national network rather than just a railway post office route or a group of routes that operated over a single railroad. And then the middle part there where it says overhead boxes, they've got some sacks there. Uh, there's a difference between sacks and pouches. It's also described in some of the videos. There's some links that will be shown later on for that. Um, but uh, the uh, newspapers, magazines, small parcels, and other matter like that were sorted in that middle area. Usually, if it was parcels, it had to be special handling or special delivery uh, because otherwise it was just handled in sacks that were in a storage mail car. So moving on, a railway post office, the, the main benefit was that it enabled the sorting of mail for several different classes of mail while the train was moving. So you were basically expediting mail uh, as it operated between two points. There were times that air mail was frequently diverted to railway post offices during inclement weather. And I've, I've seen some examples of covers where um, depending upon what uh, the origin and destination was and how far away it was from an air stop and also um, whether it was posted after the last air mail flight of a day in many cases, those letters rode overnight in a railway post office and made next day delivery. Uh, the registered mail uh, was handled uh, by a single clerk. That's That was part of first class. So registered mail is first class mail where you pay the registration fee. It uh, arranges for hand-to-hand -hand transfers and signatures between people that are handling it so that if there's any issues with how it was handled, they can trace it back. And that was under the care of one clerk. Now, crews of railway post offices, uh, they staffed the RPOs. They were post office employees, as I mentioned. The average trip length for a 60-foot RPO was about 300 miles. Um, I'm giving an example there about the New York and Chicago uh, that uh, operated in three sections between New York and Chicago. But uh, my favorite example and closer to home for the Washington chapter is the Washington and Bristol Railway Post Office. Uh, you had uh, three different locomotive crews and uh, two different, maybe it was four different locomotive crews and three different train crews but the railway postal clerks served the whole trip from the time the train left Washington, D.C., going through Monroe, interchanging with the Norfolk and Western, and then continuing on down to Bristol, Virginia. So that's a little over 400 miles. And uh, you did that standing up. In addition, the crews went on duty about two, maybe three hours before the train departed the origin terminal. So altogether, it was not uncommon for some of these clerks to be working 12-hour days and even longer if there were some en route uh, delays. Now, uh, we talk about railway post offices, but we also need to mention that storage mail cars and terminal and transfer offices were a very, very important part of the railway mail service network. Uh, if you look at photographs of uh, where you can see a railway post office car, you'll often see what most people who are railroad historians would just generally call baggage cars. Well, some of those were handling storage mail. Some of those were handling express. And perhaps only one out of the group was actually handling baggage. So this head-end traffic really represented about a third of the passenger train revenue for a train. And so when the mail was discontinued, uh, that certainly was a big hit. And then, of course, as Railway Express faded in later years and was being diverted to trucks, that was another third that went away 
about the time that passenger traffic was declining. Uh, there is your reason for the cycle of passenger train discontinuances that we observed in the 1960s. So railroads rented space on trains and railway post offices and storage mail cars on the basis of capacity and mileage. Now, they also provided terminal and transfer office facilities. For example, down in Hamlet, North Carolina, uh, for the Seaboard Airline, you had a transfer office there. Washington, D.C., Union Station had a transfer office. There was a terminal that was in the city post office, which is next door at 2 Massachusetts Avenue. And uh, a portion of that building is now the National Postal Museum. But there was a terminal railway post office on one of the lower floors, primarily to sort parcel post that was not sorted on trains. It's important to recognize that railway post offices did not just serve the post offices located along the railroad's route. They sorted for mail for post offices that were offline. They also made connections to other railway post offices. So, for example, if you were mailing a letter to California uh, and you put it on a railway post office or the post office took mail down to the railway post office, um, for example, the Washington and Grafton Railway Post Office that operated on the B&O, um, there, there maybe wasn't a cell specifically for California, but they did a handoff between railway post office routes to move the letter from one route to the next. So it would have now gone into a box into a, or a distribution case cell that would have said the Grafton and Cincinnati. The Grafton and Cincinnati RPO would have handled it to the Sin in St. Louis. At St. Louis, then you had a variety of choices, mostly going by way of Kansas City that took you the rest of the way to California. So you might have five or six different links in this railway post office network, but the railway post office car was serving not just the mail along its lines, but all the mail connecting in a nationwide network. It's also worth noting that there was more closed pouch railroad services and RPO activities. And closed pouch means that you had sacks or pouches of mail that were already sorted, that were making connections by railroad. And some of these were in storage mail cars. Some of them were carried uh, in available space within a railway post office. Uh, if you were on a branch line, uh, such as uh, going from Hot Springs, uh, from Covington, Virginia to Hot Springs, uh, there was never a railway post office on that CNO route, uh, and it's only about 20 miles long, but the baggage master handled about three feet of space allocated for mail going to the homestead, as well as any other residences and the post office at Hot Springs. The um, presentation slide that Scarlett had up to introduce this presentation uh, was notable because uh, if you really go back and look at it, it uh, shows the moment of a catch where the clerk is in the doorway with his back to the direction of travel. Uh, that was a safety issue uh, to do that. And um, the pouch has actually in that view disconnected from the top and the bottom of the mail crane. Here to the left, you can see how a pouch is suspended on the mail crane with the train approaching. And they're probably the most memorable occurrences observed by the general public. Uh, you know, other than seeing a railway post office at a station uh, and visiting and maybe mailing a letter in the letter slot that uh, if you, again, Think about that first slide that introduced this presentation uh, down at the bottom uh, past the doorway. There was a little letter slot. Uh, you could put your letter in there and it would be processed and, and postmarked on the railway post office. Uh, so um, mail was caught by a catcher arm from the side of the car. And then the a lot of times there was a pouch thrown out 
uh, of the train while it was moving. And that was all done by the clerk who was serving the local. The catcher arm and trackside mail crane were designed by Lafayette Ward back in 1866. Now, there were some efforts to try to come up with other patented devices that emulated some of the uh, catching devices and delivery devices that were in use in England. Um, those patents, um, the people who were designing those were hopeful that the post office department would um, adopt their particular patent and therefore pay them royalties and suddenly they would become rich. That never really did occur. They were tested on several different railroads, but railroads were primarily concerned with ease of maintenance and the cost uh, and expense of this trackside equipment. So if you had something that worked now, railroads really weren't inclined for going ahead and uh, switching out one thing for another. So basically this configuration that you see in this view did not change for over 10 decades. Originally catcher arms were owned by the post office department and the, the mail cranes were purchased by railroads. Later on, after about 1900, the railroad procured and maintained both of them. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, railroads were mainly concerned with expense, simplicity, and operational safety. And this is a better view, again, of the bail pouch being uh, caught in the crook of the catcher arm, and the mail clerk is going to go ahead and pull it in. Uh, catches began in 1866, and they were discontinued on April 30th, 1971. And why is April 30th, 1971 such a magic date? Uh, I can hear people mumbling, well, that's because Amtrak started up on May 1st, 1971. So the last remaining eight, there were eight remaining railway post office routes in the country on April 30th. They made their last runs and the last mail catches were up in Minnesota. Uh, and uh, after that, um, the New York and Washington Railway Post Office was the last route and it operated for about uh, six more years until 1977. However, it never did make any catches. Uh, it, the last catch on the New York and Washington was actually back in the uh, late 1950s. On occasion, the catcher pouch uh, was not retained in that catcher arm. It fell off and sometimes it uh, didn't roll away from the train, it went under the wheels. And if that occurred, the uh, everybody, the postal inspection service, the uh, local postmaster, the mail messenger did what they could to recover all the mail and if they could go ahead and piece it together, it was forwarded to the recipient in damage condition with an endorsement or an accompanying letter that explained the damage. Now, the illustration at the bottom, apparently this letter was damaged as in the pouch when it was picked up by the catcher. It must have ripped open somehow. Uh, maybe it had some coins inside. So the postal clerks sealed it back up with a sticker and then put a postmark on there with the explanation in pencil uh, damaged by catcher. We'll talk briefly about transfer offices and railway mail service terminals because they were an important part of the network. Now, you know, they didn't move around, they weren't on trains, but you had to have at major junction points, somebody who was going to supervise the connection of mail between uh, railway post office trains and between that and other ground transportation. Uh, they also uh, had a letter slot. You could mail a letter at a transfer office and they would put it into a pouch to the next available railway post office that was going in the general direction of where that letter was heading. Uh, mail at a terminal was uh, a lot different facility it had a lot of manual cases for working letter mail that uh, if there was a term in the railway mail service called going stuck, and it became more common in later years uh, when mail volume was increasing and the number of train dispatches were decreasing, uh, that <clears throat> unworked mail was taken into a terminal and it was sorted by clerks working at distribution cases. 
uh, they look a lot. If you ever go into a post office and you see the rural free delivery carriers in the background uh, making up their mail for the routes or letter carriers, uh, basically the cases look very similar. And uh, a mail terminal was generally, sometimes it was in, in space leased by the railroads, but more often it was in an adjoining property um, and um, was until recent years, uh, within the recent decades, uh, was uh, adjacent to the major railroad terminal. Now we'll detour just a little bit onto roads. Um, there were rubber tire railway post offices. And, you know, railway post offices were really the backbone of the mail service. Even though you're going to find that the uh, covers are, have railway post office postmarks, um, many, many more letters do not. They were going in and they were being sorted. What you had was railroads. Uh, they found that um, for their branch lines, it was not economical to provide service on some of those. So what they did uh, is as primary highways uh, were developed in the 1920s and improved because of the public work projects in the 1930s, um, the railroads even started turning to this road network uh, it was looking initially, it was an advocate for better roads because it felt that uh, if the better, better roads would bring more people to the train station to catch a train. Um, but it also looked at these better roads as an opportunity to reduce their cost of operation and shift some mail and shift express and maybe even passengers away from the branch line that was expensive to maintain to publicly maintain roads that uh, basically everybody used and uh, your tax dollars paid for. So uh, the railroad network was shrinking during the 1930s. Now you had the resurgence during World War II that was very notable. Uh, this is the reason why uh, that sudden buildup of wartime traffic convinced railroads around 1947, 48 or so that they're going to invest in uh, new passenger equipment because they felt like, uh, you know, the heyday of passenger travel is going to come back. Uh, you know, they did not really focus on um, how passenger travel is being reshaped by road as well as by airline travel and mostly by automobile travel. So uh, as a result, um, that's why by the 1960s, you had uh, passenger equipment that was getting to be 30 years old and the high maintenance cost was forcing railroads to rethink that decision. The passenger traffic never came back as they hoped, with the exception of maybe a few quarters such as New York to Florida that, that still remain fairly strong uh, because people didn't want to drive all the way for about a thousand miles. So uh, the conundrum for the railway mail service and the postal train station service was that as railroads began to, do, to cut away service on branch lines, on the main lines, instead of having maybe three or four passenger trains a day, they started cutting it back to two or only one passenger train a day. You had the situation where the railway post office capacity was shrinking at the same time that mail volume was increasing. And of course, one of the uh, interesting statistics here in recent years is that the Postal Service adds almost a million new delivery points every year. So that becomes very significant as you increase the number of delivery points. You know, if you don't have mail, um, a network to support that, uh, then you're trying to uh, force mail volume through a, uh, an increasingly small funnel. And it just was not really working out very well. So post office department struggled on how to deal with that. And it decided that the, the highways were creating some of this issue. So it may be part of the solution. And what they did is they uh, expanded manual distribution of terminals to handle first and second class mail that was formerly done on a railway post office. And then in addition in 1940, 
Franklin Roosevelt signed into law a, um, a bill that allowed highway post office routes to be established where there were, uh, where adequate railroad facilities were not available. It, it was basically cleverly determined uh, that, uh, you know, they didn't want to create a situation where highway post offices were competing with railroads. Uh, so that was their caveat that if the railroad facilities were not available, the post office department could establish a highway post office route. So the post office department started a, uh, set up a committee. One of the favorite things a post office department does is to set up committees. Um, and so railroads such as the Northern Pacific, Gulf Mobile and Ohio and others, they operated railway post offices and buses and called them railway post offices, but they operated over highways. And then uh, initially, between 1941 and around 1950 or 51, the railway mail service operated the highway post office. They actually had a, a railway postal clerk being the driver of the highway post offices. Um, but after that, after the 1950s and through the 1960s, they contracted out the highway post office services. The post office department no longer owned the vehicles contractors owned the vehicles, provided the driver, and you had post office clerks in the highway post offices performing the distribution. And of course, as mail distribution was transitioned to mechanized processing and centralized uh, sectional centers, railway post office and highway post office routes were discontinued. So they became obsolete. This is a busy chart, it's in your PDF file, but uh, you can see that uh, in 1960, when zip codes were introduced in 1963, that's really sort of the, the equivalent of the Berlin Wall when uh, one type of service ends or transitions, and then from that point on, everything else changes within the postal service to what you have today. This little fellow, is named Oni, and Oni lived from 1889 to 1898, and he is the subject of quite a few stories. Uh, you can find, uh, if you just uh, type in the word Oni and do a search, uh, you either come up with uh, stories about him or Oni Madden, who apparently was an Irish gangster, uh, and uh, so one day after St. Patrick's Day, uh, I don't think uh, Oni the dog was Irish. Uh, he's been generally described as a mutt. But this is an actual photograph of him. Oni felt very comfortable sitting on a mail pouch uh, for a variety of reasons. So not very many animals would be taken to a professional photographer anyway to be photographed. And uh, how do you get a dog to sit still? Well, it was easy to do with Oni if you put the mail pouch there because he always felt like he was protecting the pouch. He'd sit on it and stayed still. And here you have a photograph taken at Pittsfield, Massachusetts, somewhere about the middle of his life. The Lakeshore and Michigan Southern advertised that it was the fast mail route. And the reason for that their advertising logic was that if the government trusts the mail, which, again, back in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s, people had a much different requirement and attachment to mail service. It was the primary means of communication. They depended upon it much more than many of us do today. So the idea was if the government trusts fast mails, and consigns it to the Lakeshore and Michigan Southern and the New York Central and Hudson River Railroad, then it's got to be good. Uh, so uh, a, the um, Lakeshore and Michigan Southern always was referring to itself as the fast mail line and used the mail pouch as its logo. The first fast mail was established over those two railroads in 1875. Uh, George Bangs, uh, created the idea. It was the first expedited mail transportation in the United States. 
And it wasn't until you started having airline and airplanes in 1918 that you had anything that really rivaled the creation of the um, fast mail. Of course, the fast mail had the advantage that mail was being sorted en route uh, for an airplane. They carried the pouch and got it to the destination more quickly, but then it still had to be sorted. First class mail was routinely handled overnight between New York City and Chicago, Cleveland, Cincinnati, and St. Louis. Uh, you also have uh, another fast mail train. Some of you all have ever heard of uh, Southern Old 97. And that was a fast mail train, one of several that was established. And as you may recall the lyric, it says, uh, this is not 38, which was the Crescent, the posh all Pullman train for the Southern Railway that every morning the president of the Southern Railway was looking to see that that train was on time in his morning report. Old 97 was actually a very new train introduced around 1898. And of course it had the uh, unfortunate incident at the Stillhouse Trestle uh, near Danville, Virginia, and um, wrecked, uh, but you know, trying to make up a schedule as uh, Jim Brody was trying to get uh, to Spencer on time. So uh, coming out of Washington, D.C., it was not uncommon to get next day delivery in Charlottesville, Lynchburg, uh, and so on. It was the same way on the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac, uh, Seaboard Airline, Atlantic Coastline trains, um, going to Richmond, getting next day delivery, uh, even down into Raleigh, North Carolina, going west on the Chesapeake and Ohio. You can certainly get next day delivery into Charlottesville and uh, probably even uh, all the way over to Lynchburg uh, and Clifton Forge. This is what the fast mail equipment looked like, and that's your uh, dutiful crew standing outside of it. You, most railway post office cars were about 60 feet long, as this one was. Uh, they had about 10 to 12 clerks, and the uh, fast mail train was actually set up so that you had some cars in the train. It was about a five-car train set that uh, some of the cars sorted newspapers, Others were primarily sorting letter mail. Uh, but whatever they were doing, um, this is what your crew looked like back in 1875, ready to go on duty and work a full day. This is where we've skipped over two sections that are in your PDF files that talk about primary source documents and how you can use those primary source documents to research an envelope. Now this, this envelope is called a cover. It's got postage stamps on it, it's got an address, it's coming from someplace, going to someplace. It's got postmarks. The postmarks are what are going to tell the story for this part of the research, but they can only tell part of the story. They obviously tell, for example, that this was mailed in Lewis, Maine on, um, uh, at 9 a.m and I can't quite read the date, February 23rd, I think it is. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to go step by step how you would use some of these primary uh, source documents and uh, research cover. Now, there's several reasons why it's not common to find covers with RPO markings. Uh, I know it doesn't seem like it's uncommon because you can go on to eBay any day of the week and do a search for RPO, and you'll find hundreds and hundreds of covers. But given the millions of letters that were mailed, only a small percentage, probably less than 1%, ever had a railway post office postmark. However, the vast majority of mail moving more than 50 miles was sorted in a railway post office car. It was not postmarked in the car, but the letter package uh, out of a pouch was open, distributed, and was then dispatched. All that's covered in the videos for which Scarlett can share uh, the, the links. So the typical 60-foot RPO 
generally sorted about the crew sorted about 10,000 letters during the course of a trip. And that's a, that's about a 10 to 12 hour trip. Uh, most first class mail, as I mentioned, moving more than 50 miles was sorted in RPOs. And the, uh, the other thing that contributes to scarcity is that a lot of the mailed envelopes were thrown away by the recipients after they opened uh, the letter. They, they basically were interested in the letter inside, not the envelope. If the envelopes were saved, chances are somebody had a son or daughter who was uh, collecting postage stamps. And uh, so they would beg and uh, take the stamp off of it. And therefore you no longer have a cover that's entire with the postmark and all the other information on it. Plus that, uh, some philatelists, they, they were very album oriented. So what they did, they did what they call cut squares uh, where they would cut out the stamp and a postmark. Um, sometimes they're two inches by about four inches and stick them in an album. But unfortunately, when you do that, you don't know where the envelope was going. And if there were markings on the back of the letter, as we'll explore in a second, um, that's all gone. So um, the real benefit of covers, I find, are special delivery covers. Now, there's also covers that were serviced by collectors uh, associated with first and last runs. Uh, most of the first runs are more highway post offices because uh, back in the era when railway post offices reigned supreme, there were not very many instances where a new railway post office route was being um, established. In other cases, it was a route name change, and not very many people were out there uh, researching or collecting that type of thing. So they, there were very, very few first-run covers for railway post offices. Um, most of the first trip covers are actually for highway post offices because they were announced in advance and well publicized. Um, other covers commemorated um, the anniversary of a particular railroad. There was a fellow named in Atlanta named uh, Scott Nixon back in the late 40s and early 1950s. If you look at some railway post office covers, uh, that are commemorating, for example, the centennial of the central of Georgia or the Georgia Railroad or, um, you know, the first trip of the Sunshine Special or whatever. Uh, you'll find his name on the back of those. He was he was creating these special caches and then he was also then servicing them and uh, selling them to collectors. The postage stamp. Selected and cachet applied to the envelope might supplement uh, a cover's visual appeal, but the main thing that uh, postal historians are looking at are trying to illustrate a route's uh, beginning and ending dates, as well as linking events commemorated by a cover with the RPO services. There are also other kinds of postal markings. The postmarker was not just used to postmark letters. It appeared on trip reports, space reports, other documents. And the thing is, with most of these forms, very, very few people have actually seen them. For the most part, once their purpose was fulfilled and sent into the office, uh, they were destroyed after a retention period. So they're really fairly uncommon. And uh, the Railway Mail Service Library has some, uh, but just a smattering of what just happens to exist. So... Mailed items by the general public under ordinary circumstances illustrate the usual functions of an RPO. So one nice thing is that uh, if you want to, uh, the way I pitch it is that uh, if you are a rail fan of <clears throat> a particular railroad, such as the Seaboard Airline, uh, you can find covers for the Washington Hamlet, the Hamlet in Atlanta, Hamlet in Jacksonville, uh, these are all with train numbers that you can identify with a specific train. Now, uh, some trains like the Silver Meteor uh, and the Silver uh, Star, except in later years for the Silver Star, did not have a railway post office car, you know, but uh, certainly you can collect many 
uh, as well as there was a, a, an all-male train, train three and uh, four that operated on the seaboard airline that was just mail and express. So, you know, it's a way to go back and reach out and touch the past with something tangible that actually rode the rails on a specific date over the particular railroad. Of course, covers that are involved in accidents are um, <clears throat> very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of research that focuses on that. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, for the most part, most mail that was handled in a railway post office car did not receive a postmark. The envelopes that did are the ones that were mailed through the letter slot uh, or handed to a clerk at the doorway, or if the letter was put into a letter collection box on a platform that was collected by the RPO. Um, for example, there was a letter box at Charlottesville, Virginia, on the, at the CNO Main Street station that was collected by clerks uh, at the Queen City Hotel on the uh, B&O in Cumberland, Maryland. There were two letter boxes, one for eastbound trains and one for westbound trains to collect the mail. If uh, a piece of mail was misdirected, the postmark would be applied along with a uh, notation that said missent. And then special delivery letters were backstamped with every postmark of every um, clerk that uh, was distributing mail of that letter. So um, that is where we're going next in this little discussion about special delivery covers. Special delivery mail was particularly uh, useful from the standpoint of cover research because the only difference between the handling of a special delivery cover and the uh, first class mail is that when it got to the destination, the post office arranged for immediate delivery to the recipient. So all the intermediate steps were the same. With the postmarks that are applied to the back of the uh, envelope, you can reconstruct the line of movement. And that's applicable not only for that particular letter, but if you were interested in basically how mail was being sorted from Maine to New Jersey, and it was going to follow uh, very much the same kinds of dispatch that you'll see illustrated in this cover that we'll be investigating. So they're, they're good because they, they show you what happened in between. The covers were back stamped. They show when it was picked up or dropped in the mailbox at the, the origin post office, when it was uh, delivered at the destination post office. And then of course, uh, it's helpful to be able to fill in the gap in between with how it was handled. So this is the back of that envelope that we were looking at uh, first, and it's got some really good back stamps on it. Uh, it really defines the whole line of travel from Lewiston, Maine, to a residential address at Collingswood, New Jersey, which is just outside of Camden. So what we're going to do uh, and this, this is going to wind up the presentation, uh, is we're going to go through and look at each of these markings and then use primary source material to explain how the letter was handled. And these are the tools that we'll work with. There's two schedules of mail routes, one for the first division, which is the New England states covering Maine, and then the second division, which covers New Jersey, and then we have what we call general schemes. They are the sortation lists that say how mail was supplied or dispatched from a post office to a mail route. And uh, back in the era of the 1930s, it was almost entirely by railroad. So the first marking, as we pointed out, uh, Lewis and Maine, February 23rd, 1935, 9 a.m. And if you go into the main general scheme and go to the page that shows Lewiston, Maine in Androscoggin County, uh, you'll find that Lewiston made a dispatch to the Rumfield and Portland Railway Post Office. 
Uh, it also had some other choices. It could send mail, uh, depending upon what it was, the Bangor in Boston, Farmington in Portland, and so on. <clears throat> but in this particular case, we know it was one field in Portland that it dispatched it to because this postmark appears on the back. And on February 23rd, train 214 carried it from Lewiston down to Portland, Maine. It uh, departed Lewiston, assuming it was on schedule, at 10.10 in the morning and arrived at 11.15 in the morning. Remember, the, the cover was mailed at the post office at 9 o'clock in the morning. So it really only dawdled in the post office for about an hour before making its way to the station at Lewiston and being transported um, in a railway post office car. Now, at the bottom in these schedules, it describes what dispatches a clerk makes. So train 214 made a dispatch to the Portland and Boston Railway Post Office 156. And there's no postmark on the back for the Portland and Boston uh, because it was probably carried in a pouch that was labeled to go uh, Springfield, Boston, Springfield, New York, or Springfield, New York. Uh, we'll find that out in a second. But anyway, uh, so it, that dispatch to train 156 appears here. At Portland, Maine, uh, it left at 1029 in the morning and arrived in Boston North Station at 110. And then it also had to then make the connection to the South Station, which was basically a truck transfer. So then it was going to go on to the Boston and Albany train 29, which left Boston South Station at four o'clock and arrived at Springfield, Massachusetts at 6.45 in the evening. The next postmark is, is at Boston, Springfield in New York. It's, it's only partially legible, but there's enough to know what it says. And um, this is train 59. So looking at the schedule for the Boston, Springfield, New York, you see the train 59 Departed Springfield, Massachusetts at 5.35 in the afternoon and arrived at Grand Central in uh, New York at 8.55 in the evening. There, train 59 is going to make a connection to New York and Washington, train 107. That's the next postmark that you see, New York and Wash. Now a day has elapsed. It's February 24th. And you can't make out the train number, but you know, the connection between train 59 on the Boston, Springfield, and New York to the New York and Washington was train 107. And so 107 left New York, Penn Station at 135 in the morning and arrived at Philadelphia, 30th Street Station. I'm sorry, uh, back then it was still Broad Street Station. Arrived there at 3.30 in the morning. The Departures from Broad Street over to Camden, basically you still had a ferry. Um, I don't know if the Ben Franklin Bridge was open yet. It may have been, but uh, however it was, uh, there were dispatches frequently between uh, Broad Street Station and Camden, New Jersey. And um, all the mail that was taken to the Camden, New Jersey terminal, which this is called a flag cancel here, uh, very decorative, and it was actually a, an early type of machine canceled by American Postal Supply. Uh, another day has elapsed. Uh, it, by this time, it's February 25th. At five in the morning, it arrives in Camden. And it's a continuous office as noted at the bottom. Continuous just means that it's working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, sorting mail and making dispatches. So Camden Terminal transferred it to the Camden, New Jersey Post Office, which is where the delivery was made from. And that says received R-E-C apostrophe D at the bottom. And uh, Collinswood was an independent branch of the Camden, New Jersey Post Office. So it got there. And Camden Post Office dispatched a special delivery messenger for delivery to the Collingswood address. 
Now, if the letter had been a normal delivery, the letter would have been sent in the pouch of Camden Terminal and the College would branch post office and uh, it would have moved by the Haddonfield closed pouch bus route. And that would have taken place a day later because this day was a Sunday and special delivery was delivered on Sundays, not Mondays. But the arrow is pointing uh, to where the route is along Haddon Avenue for that Camden Terminal and, and Haddon Field uh, closed pouch, which is a bus route. Again, it was a, a special delivery messenger. So chances are they didn't really ride the bus. They were riding along in a motorized vehicle. And the small pointer where it says 13030, um, which is a black horse pike, and I guess it's there in, uh, in this part of New Jersey. It's called uh, Haddon Avenue. Anyway, that's the delivery address. So here you have a special delivery letter that was posted on the 22nd, delivered on the 24th. Not bad, you know, basically all rail, uh, five or so different uh, railway post office connections and getting it there a day earlier than a regular delivery would have been on the 25th. So this is the best part of the presentation. It's a summary slide. We've, we've talked about what the railway mail service was and talked about railway post office functions. Railway post office markings were a byproduct of railway post office activities. The nice thing about it is it provides a 21st century glimpse to the past and to the 19th and 20th century of these RPO activities that uh, no longer exist today. Information resources are the means for interpreting RPO markings. And the other part of this presentation is to make people aware that these primary source documents are available. Uh, they can be used for research if you really want to get into the weeds and understand how a particular letter moved. And they certainly facilitate cover research and open new avenues for those who are inclined to do philatelic expositions uh, for preparing exhibits. So, Scarlett, back to you. Uh, whatever's in the chat box, we'll take questions now. And I turn the controls over to you all. All right, thank you. I will just uh, start this off by saying that was a fascinating glimpse into the research and uh, just share with you something, a comment from our president, John Eldridge, who said from his experience, all this information on the outside of the envelope is far more interesting than anything he ever has written and put inside the envelope. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> uh, yes, okay, so to the questions. Um, let me scroll back a little bit. First question, for a letter mailed from DC, Washington, DC, destined for California, approximately how many hands would have handled the letter pre-Amtrak? Pre-Amtrak, where they started airlifting mail in the 1950s, if it was going more than 500 miles. So if we're talking about all rail going coast to coast, uh, you need to step back to the early 1950s before they started that program. You'd be surprised. It was not that many hands. It may have traveled over um, six or seven different railway post office routes, but somewhere along the way, even out of uh, Chicago, for example, they were working California letters. And once they go ahead, uh, once they went ahead and um, somebody was working California letters, if it was a larger city, such as Los Angeles or San Diego or San Francisco, they were making up direct letter packages that would have been pouched to California and would, would not have had any additional sorting until they actually got right to California, uh, such as the Albuquerque and Los Angeles or the um, Ogden and San Francisco. Um, and these, these both are West Division. They, they split those routes into an East and West Division. So those were the clerks where they were started doing the breakdown for city mail. So really four hands may have touched it all the way from New York to California with one of the hands being that last leg 
uh, obviously one of the hands being the first leg when you're coming out of, let's say, New York, uh, you know, making the decision that it's going to make a connection through Chicago to another railway post office, such as the uh, Chicago um, Fort Mad in Kansas City, which is a Santa Fe route. Uh, and then, you know, maybe again on that route, going ahead and making a dispatch to the Albuquerque and Los Angeles West Division, another part of the Santa Fe. Between those two, there were five different routes, but, you know, again, it was only sorted maybe twice and then just handled in pouches. So it was pretty efficient. Uh, the the whole, whole idea was to uh, make the most efficient and fastest dispatch to any destination. And part of efficiency is trying to reduce the handling so that it's minimized. Well, while we're on the topic of efficiency, on the 60-foot cars where mail was sorted, they contained rows of cubby holes for different destinations. If there were 10 workers busy sorting, didn't the men bump into each other often? Well, the, the 10 people that were in the car, first of all, in that, uh, uh, here's your trivia question when... Um, you get on Final Jeopardy, how many distribution cells were there in a standard railway post office car? And, and uh, what is 1,080? Uh, so uh, that's how many different separations there were for letters. Now, um, two facts. Each train had a different setup for those distribution cells. And then midway through the trip, they may start working different mail. Each clerk had an assignment. And so for a particular train, particular direction, they had an assignment that they would do uh, some mail uh, and maybe, for example, on the CNO, they get down to Charlottesville on the Washington and Charlotte East Division um, out of Washington, DC. At Charlottesville, uh, they were still in the same car. They were going to go all the way to Hinton, West Virginia but they may set up uh, a different uh, scheme of what they were going to sort. They, they have maybe been sorting Virginia mail up to that point in time. They may switch over and start sorting West Virginia mail. Now, the 10 clerks were not all at the letter cases. In, in that first, that illustration that was earlier on, you had about four or five clerks of the distribution cases, about three on each side, and then you had clerks in the middle of the car standing at the, uh, where they, it said overhead boxes and it had racks with sacks. And there were about three clerks there. And then you maybe had a substitute clerk or somebody else who was just helping move uh, bags around, you know, and so on like that. Uh, one clerk uh, right near the letter case was called the, the pouch man, you know. Uh, when the, the letter uh, packages were uh, tied out at the letter case, that person was going ahead and putting it into the pouches for dispatch. Uh, if there was a nonstop exchange, they would take it to the door and make the catch. And then, of course, one of the most important people there in a 60-foot car was the register clerk. All the registered mail was in the custody of that one clerk. He's the only one who could sit down during the trip because he was filling out forms. He had a little stool. In fact, I've got one underneath the table that I'm uh, sitting at right now that's from the New York Central RPO car. Uh, I could drag it out and hold it up if you want. But uh, they were just a, a four-legged stool and uh, actually stenciled on the bottom for the railway post office um, not car number as well as the railroad. So uh, they didn't, they, yeah, they bumped, they bumped into each other. When you had the racks extended and the tables, you had about a 30 inch wide passageway from one end of the car to the other. It was, it was tight quarters. And sometimes they were stacking up mail in that area between the letter cases where the clerk, clerks were standing at the case uh, for mail to be worked. So um, that thing was jam packed. And yes, they sort of did bump each other, but um, they, they managed uh, and um, did so for a century. 
Besides qualifying for the tax and physical work, did the RPO staff need any particular qualifications like a certain time experience within the Postal Service? The um, short answer to that is people had to take a civil service exam for railway postal clerk. And so it was a competitive exam. And if you didn't score at least 98% on that exam, you probably weren't going to get appointed. So uh, what you, one of the reasons why you had some very highly qualified people there in the 1930s and 40s, the depression years played havoc with people's careers. People had planned to be school teachers. They planned to be doctors, lawyers. Some may have wanted to be farmers, but the, the point is, that um, you had some very highly educated people that simply could not get a job in their profession. Now, the advantage for a civil service job working for the federal government are two things. Number one, steady work and good pay. You know, you don't worry when you're barely eating about how much vacation time you're going to get whether you're going to be able to work at home, you know, you're looking at the stability of a job that's not going to lay you off. Uh, and railroads, as you know, would furlough people and do layoffs. That did not occur in the railway mail service. So very, very attractive. So you took this exam. You got a 99%. Studying didn't stop there. And, and let me back up for the exam. The exam discussed some things like it have a little diagram, like a little railroad map where it would have some points on it and have some times. And you had to figure out for your exam question, what combination of links, A, B, C, G, F, you know, would be the shortest time to get from one end to the other. They would also have handwriting uh, specimens. How well can you read handwriting? Uh, and uh, quite a few other things like that that really tested the aptitude of how suitable you were for a job uh, in this, this kind of work. So anyway, once you became a railway postal clerk, it was constant study. Uh, the videos uh, and I, I recommend them highly. You know, the links are out there. These are in the PDF file. They're also on the screen. Unfortunately, you can't click on these links here, but you will learn as much about the Railway Mail Service <clears throat> as anybody can after watching particularly Men in Mail and Transit for a half an hour. It's a, it's a 28 and a half minute movie. And it basically, it was designed as a training movie and it steps you through all the different steps. And one of the things that it emphasizes is what you had to do to study in terms of accumulating this general scheme knowledge. You, you know, you didn't have time when you were sorting mail to go ahead and, and open that, those scheme books, the pages that I showed in the um, illustration for how you research cover. Uh, you had to memorize that. And it's generally been said that a, a railway postal clerk had the routing for a good 10,000 post offices in their mind. And in addition, it varied by train. And if a train was late, suddenly your usual connections aren't going to be made. So you had to know what your fallback position was. So very, very complex. So, um, I've wandered so much around that topic that I'm not sure, repeat that question. Let me make sure I actually answered it. Um, <laughs> I think it was, I'm scrolling, uh, whether the staff needed any particular uh, qualifications. Okay. You, yes, you did answer that. And we are running over, but I've got one final question um, related to qualifications. Did the uh, workers carry sidearms, fact or fiction? Well, yes, they did. Uh, they carried firearms. Uh, there were uh, several robberies that occurred in the 1920s. Um, there's plenty online about that. And if more information is desired, you can contact uh, the Railway Mail Service Library. But uh, at that point, 
having come out of World War I, uh, there was a surplus of 45 caliber uh, six inch barrel revolvers. And so the post office department was looking to try to uh, be a deterrent uh, for robberies. It equipped all clerks with these hand, these firearms. Uh, trouble is something uh, that uh, is a 45, six inch barrel is very heavy on your hip when you're walking or when you're standing up for 12 hours. So around 1928, they ended up buying some two, two inch barrel revolvers called Banker Specials and some other brand names by Colt, Smith and Wesson and Harrington and Richardson. And those were issued to clerks. Now, every clerk in a railway post office car, as well as highway post offices, carried those until about the mid-1960s. Then they changed the requirement to only the clerks that were working in the doorway when you were loading or unloading mail, and the clerk in charge and the registered mail clerk had to carry a revolver. The other people did not. But that lasted. The, the New York and Wash clerks were armed all the way to the last day of June 30th, 1977. All right. Well, I think this slide is an excellent one to end on. Uh, if you, I would urge everyone to watch these videos. They are fabulous. The long one is, in particular is just fascinating to watch uh, the uh, candidates training for the job, sorting, sorting things and labeling things. Um, I just want to thank you so much, Dr. Cher, for being with us tonight. And, you know, you know, I love your programs. I've seen, seen some of them before, and I thank you for sharing this with us and getting it down on tape. I think it's really important history that you I'm are making very, and recording. Very pleased to be here and hoping that uh, people remember that Boyce, Virginia is not very far from Winchester. If you want to come on by, uh, there's a whole lot more of this that's on tap. So thank you very much, Scarlett, and everybody else in the Washington chapter for all of your hospitality and take care of yourself. Yes, don't hang up. <laughs> we're, we're just, we're going to wrap up now. I did put uh, some links in the chat and one of them is to make sure I've got it, railwaymail.org. That is your library, correct? That, that's that's the website, yes. In the, yes in, the, in the PDF file, which I hope everybody gets, also has email addresses for, for me. And uh, that's a lot of time, very easy way to get a hold of me. Okay, very good. And we did send that out. If you're missing it, um, drop me a link in the chat or email me at programs at DCNRHS and I'll get that right to you. Also want to thank before we leave, um, Ann and Garen, um, our behind the scenes team who makes the magic happen for these programs. Thank you. Um, if you missed some of our programs, you can catch them on YouTube. We uh, have Mr. Lloyd, Lloyd Neal with us tonight. He's a former speaker when Atlanta took the train. He's got a, a great book out on that. As you can see, we've had a wide variety of subjects. So uh, if you're ever um, looking for an informative uh, time on YouTube to learn some more about railroad history, check out our channel there. So I think that is it for tonight. I want to thank you all again. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. <laughs>